Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our God and Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the transfigured Lord. Amen. Well, dear friends in Christ, an effective cartoon character has to be over the top and larger than life, but not too much, so you can laugh at the absurdity of the character, but still relate to the character as well to see yourself in the character as well. Well, there's a cartoon that some of you may be familiar with called Calvin and Hobbes. And in one particular iteration of Calvin and Hobbes, Susie Durkins has negotiated Calvin down to eating a worm, actually five worms, for a nickel. So that's one penny per worm. And Calvin would like to get the money, or at least some of the money, before he eats the worms. And Susie responds by saying, you don't get the money until you do the work. To which Calvin responds, man, you'd think the guy that's eating the worms would be calling the shots. To which Susie Durkins responds, if you're calling any kind of shots at all, I'm pretty sure you're not eating worms. You see, in that scenario, Calvin thinks he's holding the cards, but he really has nothing. Susie's holding all the cards. She's the one calling the shots. And I must admit, this, this is a cartoon, but I must admit that it reminds me of Peter from our gospel reading today. Often, Peter sounds made up. He sounds like a cartoon character. His foolishness is extravagant. His ego is larger than life. Peter even wants to call the shots when Jesus, in his glory, is right there. The transfiguration reading in Luke 9 highlights Peter's folly, which is a fitting theme as we enter into the season of Lent, because, as I said, an effective cartoon character, while absurd, is relatable. And we can certainly see ourselves in Peter. Well, the context of Luke chapter 9 is quite interesting because it represents a pretty major turn in the book of Luke. And so before we get to the transfiguration, we see all of this exciting stuff happening in Luke chapter 9. And the disciples are excited because they've been following Jesus. And remember in Luke, Jesus is the prophet, the prophet who's the teacher and the healer, which everybody likes, and then the prophet who's rejected, which nobody wants to hear about. And we're nearing the end of the part where Jesus is the prophet of teaching and healing that everyone likes, and soon he's going to be the rejected one. And the disciples start out the chapter 9 at being sent by Jesus to minister to the surrounding towns. They're preaching and teaching the same message that Jesus is, and they just got back and they're all excited and they're telling Jesus about how it went. They were casting out demons in his name. They were preaching with authority. It was exciting. And then we get to the beginning of this shift. And Jesus starts to say, well, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. If you are going to seek to keep your life, then you will lose it. But the person who loses their life in me will find it. And you can imagine Without the rest of the story, the disciples are hearing that and probably don't quite understand what Jesus is talking about. And then we get to our gospel reading today, Transfiguration. And we can see that the disciples, and especially Peter, they don't really know what's happening. So we get to Transfiguration. They go up on the mountain to pray. Jesus is praying, and while he is praying... He is transformed, his face is altered, his clothes become white as snow, he's in his glory, and two men join him, Moses and Elijah. Now one of the incredible things in this text, which we're not going to get into too much today, is that while that's happening, Peter, James, and John are asleep. Which often I don't think we imagine that in the picture of the transfiguration. Jesus in glory, Moses and Elijah... And Peter, James, and John are all snoozing. But when they wake up, they see what's going on. 
And here is where we begin to see that Peter doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know what the purpose of this event is. Because Moses and Elijah showed up, and they know who they are. Peter, James, and John, they know Moses and Elijah. These are major figures in their history, in our history. We just heard in the Old Testament reading, there hasn't been a prophet ever since like Moses, who knew God face to face, who worked mighty wonders in his name, mighty works of terror. But Moses and Elijah aren't there talking to Jesus about how they're doing and what they've been up to. They're not reminiscing about stories of the past. The text specifically tells us that they came to see Jesus and they're speaking with him about his departure, his exodus, which he is going to be doing in Jerusalem. And if you really think about it, it makes perfect sense. Moses and Elijah know what's going on here. This is the event that everything they did and said on behalf of God was pointing to. The fulfillment of all of the promises made through them to the people of God are going to be accomplished in Jesus. They're there to talk to him. But Peter doesn't get it. So as the disciples wake up, the text tells us that the two men, Moses and Elijah, are leaving the scene. They're exiting. And before they can leave, Peter speaks up and says, Lord, it is good that we are here. Now, this is where Peter's folly becomes apparent. And that first phrase, kind of ambiguous. It's okay. You're not really sure what's going to happen there. But James and John are probably wondering, where is he going with this? And then he follows up, Master, it's good that you are here with this phrase. Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In other words, Moses and Elijah are leaving... And we know they're leaving because we don't need them anymore. Jesus is here. But Peter doesn't understand. He wants to keep Moses and Elijah. He thinks they're the guests of honor. And if that's not folly enough, the phrase, let us make three tents, in English is a bit ambiguous. We could interpret that in two ways. One way is allow us. So he's speaking on behalf of James and John, and he's saying, let us, Lord, make three tents for you. But in Greek, that is not what's being said. In Greek, and wait for it, this, I know this was the whole week is culminating in this moment for you. In the, in the Greek, this is called a hortatory subjunctive. Take that home with you. A hortatory subjunctive is not a allow us to do this. It's an enlisting it's a, let us do this together. And so in the midst of the transfiguration, in the midst of these great figures of Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about what he's going to do, Peter says, Master, I've got a great idea. You're going to love this. Master, let us make three tents. We don't know if James and John are going to help. We don't know if Moses and Elijah brought their tool belts. But we know for sure that Peter is enlisting Jesus in his project. He thinks he's calling the shots. And the scriptures tell us that he clearly isn't because they include this phrase after he says all of this stuff. They say, not knowing what he said. Peter is babbling like a fool. He thinks he's calling the shots right when Jesus in all his glory is standing right in front of him. How very human. It's pretty relatable for us, is it not? How often do we think that we're the ones in charge, that we're the ones calling the shots, and then instead, like Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, we realize that we got suckered into thinking we were in charge, and now we're going to eat a bunch of worms for pennies. So what is God's response? Pretty soon, right after this, it actually says, as Peter's saying these things, the Father is not very amused. He comes in glory in a cloud, and the text tells us that while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. 
And they're afraid. This is something like the naked glory and presence of God because that's exactly what it is. And at this moment in time, James and John are probably thinking, I wish Peter wouldn't talk so much. If the altered face of Jesus, the shining clothes, the glory of Jesus, Moses and Elijah isn't enough, God the Father himself appears and speaks and he says this to Peter. And he's addressing Peter and through Peter us. For those who are trying to think that they're in charge, that they're the ones calling the shots. And he says, this is my son. I have chosen him. Listen to him. He is the master. He is the Lord. He is the one who's calling the shots. Does it work? Does Peter listen? Well, not right away. It takes a little while. Because again, in the upper room, Jesus says, I'm going to leave you. And you're going to fall away from me. And Peter's response to that is, I will not leave you even if everyone else does, Lord. I'll never deny you. He has no idea that there's going to be three crows of the rooster. And he does exactly what he claims he won't. He's done. So does Peter ever change? Yeah, he does. When he receives the Holy Spirit, he changes. He understands. After Jesus rises from the dead, appears to him and the disciples, and then clothes him in power from on high, and you can hear it in the sermon he preaches in Acts chapter 2. He gets it. He understands. It's been revealed to him. He knows he's not the one calling the shots. In a phrase, Peter learned to deny himself. After all, that's just what right before this text Jesus calls his disciples to do. Deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. But in the transfiguration account, Peter is counting on himself. He thinks he's the Lord. He thinks he's the one that's got to come up with the plan. And he even tries to enlist Jesus in it. If Jesus is the one calling the shots, the one who is Lord, how does Jesus do Lord? How does he call the shots? He lets everything go for you and me. His power, his glory, his life, given up. And now he comes to us with more than just an altered face. His whole body is changed. It is filled with the eternal life which he now gives freely as a gift of grace to you and me. Now, we aren't Peter, thank God. Peter served a unique role in history, but we can certainly relate to Peter, can't we? The tendency to speak up and bloviate and make promises that we can't keep. The tendency to think that we need to have the plan, that we need to enlist Jesus in our ideas unsatisfied with his or not knowing what they mean or when they're going to happen. Like Peter, we often think, I'm the one in charge. I'm the one holding the cards. But the answer is, no, you're not. Peter's not calling the shots. You're not calling the shots. I'm not calling the shots. Jesus is calling the shots. This is my son, I have chosen him. Listen to him. So dear friends in Christ, I have a challenge for you in the season of Lent, which begins next week. I have a suggestion for something that you can give up. And you can give this up for Lent and Easter and Pentecost and the rest of the church year as well. Give up control. Give up arrogance. And the fear that leads you to think that you need to be the one calling the shots. Ask God to save you from wanting to enlist him in your building project. Ask God to save you from thinking that my vision of success has anything to do with what God has in store. After all, how do the disciples who started out the chapter of Luke 9 excited clear-eyed and understanding and preaching God's word, how do they end our text today?
the gay. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. They were confused, terrified, and silent. So often are we in the presence of God's plan, not always knowing what they are. So I invite you this morning to let go. Jesus is the master. He is the Lord. He is God's chosen one. Listen to him. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in this knowledge that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one calling the shots, and because of that, you are secure in all the promises that he has made to you, for he is faithful. May that give you peace until he comes again in glory. Amen.